प्लीज हैव ए सीट मैम लॉट ऑफ रेड्यूज नाउ राइट Uh, so first of all, um, thank you for giving me this opportunity because I think uh, after a very very long time I'm talking to um, the people outside my uh, domain, right? So it's always good. And in terms of first, I think uh, first of all we have an international speaker join us online, so <laughs> it's really great. Hi, Wouter, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, my pleasure. Hi. <laughs> right and i think uh, it's been a great day so far in terms of the other first other than humans there are also pigeons listening to us so <laughs> you know another good one actually um so in terms of uh, data breach right so um two disclaimers uh, before we begin the talk actually uh, by the way being a lawyer the first disclaimer is a standard right i mean the views expressed here are our personal views and uh, it has nothing to do with the organizations that we work for and i believe this disclaimer holds good for the other panelists as well second dis uh, disclaimer is rather funny um we are a bunch of lawyers here so we may not be able to address any security related questions so out of syllabus questions please excuse us <laughs> right <laughs> so with that let's get uh, uh, you know started with the session in terms of data breaches i can go on giving you guys like a thousand examples right i'm but let me restrict it to three first of all i think healthcare is obviously the most impacted industry in terms of data breaches because that is where the patient data is you know crucial and a lot of personal sensitive information is um, you know sort of um, leaked and out at stake there right so the latest uh, you know uh, bandwagon to join this uh, race is not in healthcare uh, the breach was as recent as december 2023 where more than 2.5 million um, patients data was compromised right so now that's healthcare <clears throat> next example um, is a far different one right you probably wouldn't have heard this and unfortunately it is again the latest as uh, early as 4th of jan 2024 right the courts in victoria australia they were hacked apparently okay so the recordings of court hearings uh, were actually uh, out there right and fortunately uh, according to what the australian authorities claim is that no other financial data or any other personal data was leaked so at least you know damage control to an extent uh, was present there uh, third um, in terms of an example again this is a slightly different one but an older one actually qatar national bank right this case actually uh, the data leak happened uh, way back in 2016 right i mean it's pretty old but the reason why i'm quoting this example is because again data of um, uh, 3 million plus users was actually impacted right and a bunch of turkish hackers apparently uh, you know were traced back and they were the ones who actually uh, caused this but you know the hackers on one hand that's fine what's interesting in this particular data breach is that uh, there was a political angle to it so the hackers claimed that the alleged authoritative um, control of uh, the government of qatar was causing lot of um, uh, you know unrest in the surrounding areas of middle east and that is the reason why this was sort of their revenge now it's a very you know psychological um, uh, element which actually comes into play um and i will touch upon uh, some of these aspects in my uh, closing remarks in term in terms of uh, forward looking thoughts right so uh, the way there was by the way another reason i i mentioned particularly why i'm happy to be here today uh, because we are collaborating and i think that is the way to go in terms of future security professionals like you and lawyers like us you know i mean we bring in different perspectives we understand and work with each other so you know this again i'll elaborate uh, you know uh, in a bit about this now moving on to the panel discussion i uh, have a lovely bunch of uh, panelists here water i'd like to start from you so the question to you is obviously you uh, your company is a multinational and you have seen different kinds of data breaches uh, you know both in your organization as well as in your career i suppose right so being a dpo um, what is it that you have come across in terms of 
cross border data breaches right uh, especially in countries where um, you know underdeveloped or developing nations where there is a lack of regulatory framework right because data breaches and regulatory framework kind of play hand in hand and also from a practical perspective what are the challenges faced um, in these huge uh, data breaches your insights would be helpful over to you yeah, well, thank you for, for the question. Very great question. Um, and indeed, uh, I think this is an absolute uh, challenge um, 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 being faced with international data breaches, uh, both on an organizational way, but also um, um, the, 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 interest, the interesting things you see um, when absolutely trying to follow the rules. Um, here, um, in my experience so far, is, 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 it's on the one hand very difficult to um, identify your Im the impact of your international breach because um, it's the, the sources that you that you have to your uh, that, that, that you can that you can um, 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 use um, might not always have the latest information uh, on, on, on local laws. Uh, or it's very vague, or you need to uh, be able to translate, and then you get the interpretation of that law. Um, and then um, another very interesting part is then if you do want to um, 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 report, because you have an obligation in an international uh, data breach, and you stumble upon the fact that you need to report to the supervisory authority, it's often that the law states that, that it's applicable, but then you are unable to uh, report this law to that supervisory authority because it's only possible to do that with uh, a national ID. So if you're a citizen of the specific country and from an international perspective, it's, it's sometimes impossible to report this breach or they want you to do it. Um, uh, it has to be done by somebody that, that, that lives in the country. And I think this is uh, very um, um, interesting or at least a, a challenge that needs to be uh, uh, solved because it's not so much that we don't want to report but it's yeah why should somebody we can't ask somebody on a personal level to report this right that that's that's weird because they were not involved and the entity itself in that country might not even be involved uh, because it happened on a global system that was not even uh, with this entity but still we need to report by law because it was applicable so i think this is one of the major challenges uh, that i face so far in my career when i uh, when i uh, talk about international data breaches Sure, thanks for that. I think just, uh, you know, to add to it, uh, Walter, if I may, a uh, couple of other things like, for example, your data retention policies, right? I mean, and in terms of disaster recovery management, I think all these also play a big part as far as organizations are concerned, right? And apart from that litigation, which, you know, being a lawyer, I mean, like this, we do it day in, day out. And in terms of litigation, it you can't really, uh, you know, I mean, measure what the litigation is actually going to do because in, when a data breach occurs, you know, somebody sues somebody, it may be a cross-border dispute or it may be within the country. You know, that's the big thing that is to look out for. And of course, falling that suit is definitely uh, penalties which hits you big. Right, so these are a couple of other aspects as well. Now, moving on, um, you know, slightly change of flavor. Avinash, I'd like to come to you. Uh, can you share your thoughts on um, the regulatory aspects in particular? I mean, be it global, be it uh, you know region specific. How do they sort of interplay with uh, the breaches? Where we were, where we are, and where we are heading to? Uh, thank you. So. Regulatory approach, I think it's a very interesting. I think two days back, Italian Data Privacy Authority imposed penalty on Trento. It's a city in Italy. And uh, they got a research funded, you know, like some funding from the European Union to collect some data of their citizens by using AI algorithms and AI technologies. So perfectly legitimate. Money is coming from European Union, and the local age, local administration is implementing that technology to collect the data. So it looks very perfect. Then the data privacy authority says, no, no, this is breach of privacy laws. And they impose penalty on them around 50,000 euro. So I think this is a very classical example, which we will see in India also, because when you talk about the regulatory aspect, I always see my experience 
uh, with the CCI, Competition Commission of India, I, I was the legal advisor for many years in Delhi. So how regulators think, you know, that's very important for maybe lawyers as well as for non-lawyers because ultimately burden will come on you. Okay, lawyers are just playing with words, but uh, ultimate final impact will come on tech people and business people. If they say, no, no, you can't do this, then your business guys will lose some business. Tech people, you will have to start maybe from fresh or maybe you need to change your R&D planning and strategy and normally you are not very comfortable with that because you have your own mindset and you want to develop a good technology or maybe you want to implement a good technology. So this regulatory uncertainty can bring a lot of challenges for business people as well as for uh, tech people. Lawyers, we are used to this. Okay, so, and ultimately we have nothing to lose in this, you know. We, we have always one excuse that it's a regulatory approach. What we can say, it's a law of the land. Simple. Like as a lawyer, I can give my legal opinion, but finally court will decide. So you can't blame your lawyer. Okay, so this is very interesting how regulatory bodies think. So in a regulatory approach, we always talk about type 1 error and type 2 error. So type 1 error when the regulatory bodies intervenes and they stop something which they are not supposed to stop. Okay, they don't understand technology or they don't understand market dynamics and they stop because they are very afraid of. Or maybe some stupid bureaucrat or a judge is heading that regulatory body. Okay, they have their personal biases sometimes. I remember there was a one member and uh, he was hearing one matter in infra sector, uh, in, 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 in housing industry. He said, no, no, all these builders are fraud, they are crooks because, you know, my brother-in-law, he also bought a house and he was, you know, cheated by one builder. No, but they are humans actually, you know, so it's a simple. And that's more tricky for the tech people because technology is very evolving and regulatory bodies normally at the top level, they don't have understanding. At the mid-level, they hire experts. They somehow try to understand. And their job is to brief to their seniors, like the retired IAS officers or uh, retired high court judges, uh, to tell them, okay, okay, sir, what is this technology? How is it going to impact? Uh, whether it's a violation of data privacy or you know other things or not. It's their job. But they are also half-cooked, you know. They are also not very qualified and talented people. But still they know something. So it's very dangerous to understand the regulatory aspect. So type 2 error when they don't intervene at all. They, they don't understand and they don't intervene. They say it's too risky to intervene right now. Because we want to technology to develop. So as a tech people, when you talk to your public policy people, your compliance, compliance are maybe not that important because they don't worry about what law will be. What the, whatever the law, they will comply. But your public policy people in your companies, I think you should talk to your public policy guys rather than lawyers. Because just lawyers also like, we really don't worry whatever the law will be after 10 years, five years, we will tell you. But public policy team, I don't know how, like, you know, how big the public policy teams are in the Indian IT sector. So if you don't have a public policy team or if you don't have expertise in public policy, uh, that can be a very dangerous thing. Because a public policy guy in the technology sector can guide you, can update you that uh, how regulatory bodies are going to think in next two years, five years, and that input can really help you to design and implement your policies because uh, tech, tech, especially, see business guys are still flexible, they are MBAs. Okay, so you know them, they just change their Excel and PPT and things will change. But uh, for tech people, I, I, I don't know much about technology, but I have great respect for technology people because I don't understand them. Okay, so when you don't understand something, either you don't like them or you have a great respect. But I believe that uh, technology is complicated. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's like. That's my job, actually. <laughs> my job is to make you confused. <laughs> yeah, and I'm a professor now, more dangerous. <laughs> Law professor. So it's more dangerous, you know, because sometimes within our classroom, we give five statements, contradictory statements. 
Lawyers at least they can't do it. Because they have to be consistent. Law professors, we can say anything, you know. We don't. Uh, one day, one lady, uh, sir, that day you told this thing, man. Today I am saying this. <laughs> no, but our job is to think. Think, evolve. So my suggestion is, uh, like, a, if you ask about the takeaway, then you should talk to your public policy guys. And if you don't have a public policy team in technology sector, make a team. If you can't make a team, hire some good experts who can give you some input. How tech public policy regarding your technology is going to evolve in India and abroad. That input is very, very important. Without that input, uh, your compliance, your, uh, your legal team, they won't help you. Um, to, to add on to Avinash's view, um, so business always look for the commercial benefits out of it. So whatever it comes in the market or technology, I have been repeatedly saying this, they would like to commercialize. The other legal experts or industry, the firms, they always come up with whatever thoughts, thoughts will be one page, disclaimer will be the subsequent pages which will be running, okay? The techies who are in the system, they are getting squeezed between these two, okay? They may not really and having an expert idea of how to po get the business or how to do, because the organization will mandate, come up with something new technology where I have to go as the ahead of the curve in the market. So you have to come, what it is, and they'll say, I will invest. When you go to the table, the investment will be very minimal. They'll say, minimize, squeeze it, then we'll go for open source, all that. My one suggestion is, all techie guys, be friendly with your in-house counsel. Don't go with external law firm, in-house counsel. Tell the problem. I think this is a dichotomy. The in-house counsel also will run. Okay, balance between your data protection, business, and the innovation of your technology. I think you both should be two sides of the coin and the organization to always enable. Absolutely. Can't agree more. Uh, thank you, Avinash, and thank you, Deepa, as well. So I think regulation and um, technology is always at least to my mind, is a catch-22 situation, right? Because you develop a technology and then realize that the laws are always lagging behind. Then you go and amend the law or implement a new law, and then again you're stuck in a limbo because, you know, there are many other sectoral laws or international laws or whatever the case may be. It's all the time confusing, <laughs> right? Now, moving on from regulation, Deepa, um, can you shed some light on, um, you know, specifically with respect to the APAC region, because uh, we are all here in APAC region, uh, with respect to data breaches and, you know, what your thoughts are uh, from a regional perspective. So, um, I think, you know, as, as Water indicated, as well as the, uh, Avinash was saying on public policy and organization, APAC slightly, I'm looking at it as a hotspot now. And uh, data breach management is becoming the complex and evolving topic in every organization. Today, if you look at it, incident management was there in the organization earlier. It never gained the momentum. But the jargon started using as a data breach management or data breach notification, especially the recent regulation which is coming out. This is really gaining in momentum. One. So, as a country which is organizing in the multiple geographies or a jurisdiction, they are going through the tough time to manage the legal landscape. I think someone was raising in the morning, how do we do, how do we manage these compliances, right? So I, we always say that out, take as a thumb rule of an one comprehensive or a, the law which is having a more influence on your business area. So if you look at it, GDPR comes out from the global aspect. But when we look at it in the APAC region, I, I prefer to go with either a Singapore or Canada paper. Right? So you keep that as a thumb rule, try to align because Australia, Singapore, Canada, I think they have a comprehensive data privacy law, which is primarily addressing your breach notification aspects. When you come out the some of the countries, out of your 30 countries, I think today, more than 75% of the countries in the APAC region or not clearly addressing your data privacy or data breach notifications, okay? So the major challenge where it comes to us all of us is because the sector specific or fragmented laws of the countries which is operating, especially India laws also, even today DPDPA has come in, is it addressing extensively? I think 
it's the question remains unanswered. So we are ready to wait for a notification. So you take China. China also it's the same. So when the breach notification we are addressing, there are multiple components we try to do. What is the threshold of our data breach notification? Do I need to inform them or not? So when it comes to India, you have to notify in six hours and the number of records has not been given. When you go to Singapore, it is 72 days, but the records are limited, 250 records. If it's more than that, the data, you need to go and disclose. You come to China, it is eight hours in terms of your cyber security and the data are exceeding more than 1,000. I think 10,000 is a capping if I'm not wrong. So the hours and the threshold is keep varying on all these. My business model remains same, my product remains same, but my services remain same, my compliance requirement in terms of these data breach notifications varies across. Okay, as I said, the APAC region become a hotspot. If we look at it, the recent report published by IBM on the 2022, I think 2,800 cyber attacks has been happened. So when the cyber attacks happens, it's not only a financial loss. We all need to look at it. Probably Walter was also indicating how it is impacting the IP, the brand, reputation of the company, as well as your product pitch, which you would have planned for that particular industry. And second, as you rightly said, the legal sanctions or legal liabilities which is going to create. Two angles to it. One is the penalty metrics or penalties or your administrative fines which you are going to do. The second angle is, how is the user remedial one which you are going to address? Today, maybe India is not addressing, but other uh, acts which is addressing on your remedy given to your data subjects or data principle. That is also one loss to you and financially and sanctions. I think these parameters, when we look at it broadly, I think every organization should drive on four pillars. One is technology advanced one and having your legal compliances. What is your base comprehensive data? Then we can go within sector specific or product specific and that needs to be added. And coming back to your ethical behavior, I think that plays a very, very crucial role. The earlier also somebody was saying, the employee creating a training awareness, it's not only your employee, your supply chain. You may share some data for a particular purpose. You need to keep creating an awareness to your partners and suppliers equally because they are an ecosystem. If they have done something, the accountability principle lies on us as an organization or OEM or the entity controllers. I think that's where we need to focus. So one, I think I have seen recently from the positive way how things are moving in, in the last four, four, two years or three years. It's increasingly the alignment and strategies are happening with the synergies happening across the laws. So all the majority of the countries like Thailand, Vietnam, you, if you see that out, Philippines, either they are trying to align their existing laws to and GDPR to the extent majority, I feel that's because of the, the, the collaboration or the cross-border often working organizations voice has been heard. They are trying to map it out. That's one angle. The second, in especially in a APAC region I'm looking at, there is a Asia-Pacific economic cooperation, cross-border privacy rule, cross-border privacy um, rules of Asian framework on personal data protection. All these are getting formed, which is going to create a cross-border collaboration as well as on the harmonization of a data privacy requirement as well as on the data breach. I think I see that it's, it's a good progress. We look forward, it's even more synergies can happen that could give the better comfort to an organization or emerging market. And uh, I think APAC is having a digital maturity now uh, in terms of you know, having an economy where we are focusing on that. Brilliant. I mean, I think uh, spot on and uh, thank you so much, Deepa, for that. Uh, I think, you know, very practical insights. So with that, you know, I'd just like to... Uh, touch upon another aspect now, which is, uh, you know, equally important, right? So Avinash, I will be coming to you on that. So before I do that, so um, from whatever the little technology, uh, you know, reading that I actually do, um, I have understood that, you know, when a data breach occurs, it takes about 280, 280 days to kind of, you know, uh, do a full-blown investigation, set things right, and so on and so forth. Now, that's almost a year, right? So, 
uh, even though the technology is advanced and you have all the regulations in place and all that, but this is the ground reality. And other ground re realities like uh, your new age technologies like AI, ML, and uh, of course today, today the talk of the town is deep fake, um, hitting you uh, with what God only knows, right? So with all these things in play, I think it it's good for us to kind of, uh, you know, nip this in the bud, right? So Avinash, my question to you in doing so is that as an academician, right, how do you think academics can actually help uh, in tackling data breaches and where do you think the education system um, is actually heading? I think there are uh, two issues here. Data breach or cyber attacks never happen accidentally. They are planned, highly planned. And uh, companies, I believe, they keep giving a lot of training also. Okay, do's and don'ts, you know, don't click here, don't click there. But somehow, the criminals, they need only one opportunity. So I think that's not my very big concern. It's, it's, it's a big, it's a game actually. Historically, throughout civilizations, we are playing this game. You know, police and chore. <laughs> So that's, that's not a problematic. I think we need to create more awareness. Uh, from the law enforcement side, we need to punish those cyber criminals, which we are not doing. Interestingly, you will find city like Bengaluru, so-called IT hub in India, most advanced people in Karnataka or in India, the prosecution rate, prosecution rate in cyber crime in Bengaluru is only 2%. So it means key if 100 criminals First of all, all cyber criminals are not identified and never caught. So if they are identified and if they are caught by police and then trial happens, after a fair trial, only 2% criminals go to jail. So if you see the larger picture, it means that only 2% people are going to jail, means that almost out of 500, because I believe only 20% cyber crimes are reported to police. So it means out of 500 criminals, only two criminals are going to jail. So that's a second part, you know. But that's not the agenda of this discussion. What I believe, cyber security is a big part, but uh, considering the tech policy and cyber law, cyber security, uh, somehow I think we need to blame IT professionals also. They have, no, because I think that's my job, you know, to identify that why this is happening. Yeah, because I'm not paid for anything nowadays, you know, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm just paid for to speak truth of mine. IT sector, senior people are trained not only in IT, but management and business also. After 15 years, you are not doing IT anymore, you are doing business. But how many IT professionals are really trained in tech law, tech policy? Very fair, very rarely. I think this is the time that the senior leaders in IT firms, they should get proper training in information technology law and policy. Cyber law, cyber policy, cyber crime investigation, and AI law, AI policy, AI ethics. So these are the areas, data law, data privacy law, data policy. I think these are the areas where I believe IT professionals must learn now. I am very sure that this is not happening. I have spoken with very senior IT professionals and uh, I am sorry to say but they have no idea about cyber crime investigation. They have no idea about data privacy law in terms of policy side. They, they have least idea about ethics and fairness of AI which is happening at the global level. So they believe that their compliance team will tell them what to do and they will do. No, but that's not the right approach. So what academic institutions should do, that they should try to create a bridge between academics and working professionals. They should design programs. And I think disclaimer, somehow I'm promoting my LLM programs also. Okay, LLM professional. So we have run, we have started India's first LLM professional in data privacy and cyber law for non-lawyers. Because I believe that non-lawyers have to learn law and policy. 
they are not supposed to be expert. Like the, for example, you are not expert in business, MBAs are better. But still when you do business, IT business after 15 years as a director and vice president, your business understanding plays an important role. Same thing when you talk to your GC, compliance officer, DPOs, you have to have good understanding of all these laws. So academic institutions should design those programs, implement those programs, but with a disclaimer that we should, we have to protect those programs from professors. <laughs> yeah, because if you give this task to professors, they will make a theoretical teaching. So all these things must be done by practitioners, just like a democracy. So programs must be designed by industry people and delivered by the industry people. Academicians and law schools and universities should play a role of a platform. We are very good in platform. So we should restrict ourselves because executive education must be done by working professionals. If we can do it, our programs will be really industry standard programs because a lot of law schools in India, they are running PG diploma in cyber law and cyber security. And I'm so sorry to say all those top professors, they have never seen a FIR of cyber crime investigation. They have no idea what happens before breach, during breach and post breach. They teach sections and case laws, that's all. That's very, very problematic and it's not good for anyone. So in Manipal Law School as a director, because I come from industry background, before joining academia, I work with CCI, EY, Deloitte. So I believe that there is a need. So you industry people should collaborate with different law schools and other academic institutions. And please tell them that we want to design quality programs for you. And we will also help you to do marketing. You know, because you guys are very bad in marketing also. Okay, we, if you design a program, you won't be able to sell it. Sell it to the right audience. You know, we don't want to sell prog like high quality program to freshers. So programs must be designed as per the need of the industry, must be sold to the right audience, delivered in a right spirit, so that we can create knowledge and skill set. I think that in long term, that will help cyber security, data breach issues, uh, ethical and legal issues, because it's not only law. I believe in AI, the biggest challenge is coming before the IT guys is not law. It's ethics, because ethics is not defined anywhere. And AI, the big issue is that what is ethical? Who will define ethics? So I think these type of areas you have to learn. It's all philosophical. I think you should know Stanford University. A uh, few years back, they identified five areas where a computer scientist, computer science engineer must learn. And one of the paper out of five is philosophy. You have to learn philosophy now. Maybe it looks very stupid, but if you are designing a technology and if you have no understanding of philosophical dimension, ethics, morality, how this technology is going to affect the society, because at the core, if you don't do it, then all litigation, compliance, all this bullshit will keep going. But as a scientist, you are, you are creative people. See, lawyers are not, we are not creating anything. You know, we are just enjoying other people's creation. What, you do something good, we will make the IP license. <laughs> if you do a mistake, we will go for a litigation or arbitration. But you are creative, scientists are creative. Computer science, you are coding, you know, the algorithms, you are creating. Compliance people are not creative. They are tick of the box approach. So, I'm sorry, you know, I hope that... No, we are a protector. I don't mind, I don't want to be... See, everybody is creators and who will protect them? See, I am no, a protector. No, 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 I'm not saying, but see, I think we need to give more value to creators. Yeah. You know, I think there is some, uh, there has to be some line that creators, innovators, philosophers, the people who are giving something new to society, they must get more due respect. However, it's not happening because you have no idea what are you doing. And what is the impact of your technology on human civilization? 
बिकॉज इफ यू क्रिएट समथिंग वेरी डेंजरस टेक्नोलॉजी या यू कैन एंड यू आर वेरी एक्साइटेड अबाउट इट बिकॉज यू आर एक्साइटेड अबाउट आउटकम ओ इट्स गिविंग अमेजिंग रिजल्ट बट देन इफ यू डोंट अंडरस्टैंड द एथिकल एंड मोरल डायमेंशन ऑफ योर टेक्नोलॉजी टू सम एक्सटेंड यू आर हार्मिंग द सोसाइटी सो इट्स अ ह्यूज रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑन साइंटिस्ट एंड इंजीनियर्स टू क्रिएट राइट टेक्नोलॉजी फॉर सोसाइटी वी लॉयर्स शुड नॉट टेल यू वॉट इज द राइट टेक्नोलॉजी रेगुलेटर शुड नॉट टेल यू वॉट इज द राइट टेक्नोलॉजी इट हैज टू बी सेल्फ रेगुलेशन इट हैज टू बी सेल्फ रेगुलेशन लाइक इन मेडिकल रिसर्च वी हैव एक्सेप्टेड दैट वी विल नॉट डो वी विल नॉट गो फॉर ह्यूमन क्लोनिंग वी कैन डू इट साइंटिस्ट कैन डू इट बट वी एग्रीड एंड एक्सेप्टेड कि वी विल नॉट डू इट बिकॉज इट्स नॉट गुड फॉर ह्यूमन सिविलाइजेशन सो आई थिंक दोज टाइप ऑफ बाउंड्रीज अनफॉर्चुनेटली आर नॉट देयर इन आई टी सेक्टर राइट नाउ पीपल आर जस्ट क्रिएटिंग टेक्नोलॉजी विदाउट अंडरस्टैंडिंग देयर मोरल एंड एथिकल डायमेंशन सो आई थिंक लॉ स्कूल्स एंड यूनिवर्सिटीज शुड प्ले एन इम्पोर्टेंट रोल टू टीच एंड डू डिस्कशन एंड मोरल एंड एथिक्स ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी sure thank you so much avinash for the in depth um, uh, you know view on the entire uh, interplay between education and uh, technology with that wout um, you know moving on to you uh, could you suggest some uh, you know best practices to be adopted from a privacy perspective in particular as far as uh, data breaches are concerned and also any practical pointers that you would like to um, give the audience as much as we can but to a certain extent these gcps i would say all the csps are so powerful that they share very limited information so please share light on that yep see um let let me try to address this question from a legal perspective of what yes. documentation can do that mm -hmm. uh, probably then your supply chain ecosystem as well as your technology how you are connecting with them that mm -hmm. that also plays a crucial role as you rightly come back see today you will create the documentation in any organization firstly i say that out prepare yourself for the data breach or a controls okay you miss on the gamut of an 100 controls don't lose it okay you are you should be focusing primarily on the controls which navi sir said or iso 27 no 100 or 27 700 one series says at least that is very crucial first for us because that's the one which is going to control from your external risk factor which is the data flowing in internal world the second is align with your organizational vision and values then you decide the threshold of your supplier partners in the region whom you are going to get it so if this threshold has been maintained either it can be from an uh, vendor experience perspective your partners or you engaging them with the some score maintain that's that's probably the next session which navi sir is going to take it which is very crucial so that should be the criteria for you to select you should not compromise on that don't go on go with always the commercial which is an l1 bidder for me then i'm picking it up i think that should not be the one sick yeah yeah go practical points for you to take away right one having an audit clause in the contract is very good brilliant but are the audits actually conducted right there is a big question mark on that because companies don't have workforce to conduct audits on a third party right so and then there are these commercial shortcomings and so on and so forth it's always good to conduct periodic audits on your ecosystem right second feel the pulse on the floor don't go to the vendors ask your customers what troubles they are facing and then go tackle the vendors accordingly that's my two cents yeah. so the, the last one but not the least is uh many many mncs which i have been saying they are calling the team who is actually on the ground don't call you are the head of the departments of your counterpart you make the person who is working on the team the system no developer ask them to give your codes or make them to come on a system to complete that and make it earlier it, it's a journey i have been saying data privacy impact assessment is something we are doing annual or fortnightly i think that culture has to come as in monthly ones you should run or probably you know every quarter we should make it that gives you a more analysis and the insight about your organization or as well as the vendor what they are going through as ashish mentioned uh, like he as he emphasis uh, put emphasis on ethics i would like to ask wouter about uh, from the philosophical angle uh, as trust is a central characteristics of ethical life 
so how organization rebuilds trust after a ma massive data breach and paying hefty fines is there any standard approach or a proven method to do so thank you no yeah wow that's a, that's a very interesting question and um um well i just thought they they asked they said like a, a final question and keep it simple right so this is and then you ask me a philosophical question and this is interesting now yeah i you know uh, trust comes in uh, they have this saying, I believe, um, and I always say it wrong, but trust comes in by foot and that it leaves by train, right? So it's 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 a very, very, very difficult to regain trust of your customers. If you um, if you lose it, yeah, you 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 have to go to in to extending lengths and 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 yeah, sometimes it's even impossible to to regain that trust, or at least in the short term, um, and that is yeah, uh, I I I would not say there is absolutely an um, uh, a standard way of doing so. It also typically depends on on your company and service. So um, sometimes people just can't avoid using your service and then they maybe do not trust you anymore, but they tend to forget uh, uh, quickly. But if you are, um, uh, if there are many other services, people will leave, right? They will, they will leave and they will get a subscription somewhere else or they will uh, go somewhere else and and for example if you look at healthcare yeah in, in a hospital yeah i don't really choose my hospital based on on their breaches i just need help and uh, especially when there's an emergency i go there so they they are, might uh, uh, have less impact on this trust issue but if you're a commercial company and you have competitors yeah then then if you breach that trust you will lose your customers and it's very hard to regain that trust um in the in the future um, and and get those customers back. I think it's um, it's it's a very difficult thing. Okay. Okay. Good now. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a good one. Um, I think with that, I think we are come to a close. Thank you very much, uh, the panel. M May I request Tanker to come over this and hand over the moment. Okay, last few. Ah, last few quiz. I don't know how many shields are there, but those are last few. Okay, let's go. Question number one. Question number one, please, Sumant. Yes. Already raised. Got it. To streamline communication and response efforts during a breach. Are we confident that answer? Yes? Okay. Okay, next one. Potential financial reputational damage. That does it work? Do you believe that, right? Already clapping here. Kya karu mein? Majority, <laughs> 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 <la